Awkward hair smeller guy. I was coming home from work a while back. At the time, I was working in residential construction, so I wasn't looking too hot or whatever. Coming home on the bus, this shady character in a long black trench coat gets on and sits next to me. We ride in silence until he reaches down and plucks one of my hair sheddings off my shirt, looks at it, and takes a big whiff of it. I asked him if it smelled good. He said yes. Silence in the library. I'm still relatively new to Reddit, so I don't really know too much about it. I am a fan of YouTube videos though, when I'm doing things around the house. I like to listen to readings on YouTube of Reddit stories, both hilarious and terrifying ones. One day as I was cleaning, a video I listened to finished and automatically played the next one, which was a stalker story reading. After hearing other people's encounters, I decided that maybe I am ready to share one of mine, too. I posted a story of mine earlier, and I got a lot of positive reinforcement, so I think I want to post another one. This is an encounter that went on over the span of maybe a month, then continued on from a distance for the next two years. This is a pretty long story, so I'm sorry if it gets boring. Growing up, I lived in a small town. I don't mean footloose small, with a mere 14,000 people, I mean really small with only 1,000 people, when I moved there in the first grade. I didn't make any close friends all throughout my school days, and wanted to get pretty far away. The farthest my parents would let me go for school though, was a few states over to study Japanese, at a private university in Ohio. My freshman year flew by, I met a ton of new people, and my Facebook exploded with friend requests from both domestic and international students alike. Not remembering everyone I met, I accepted them all. I was young and excited to make new friends. I ended up making a lot of good friends. I was actually kind of, dare I say it, popular. By my second year, the leader of my department had deemed me the big sister of the program. It was a small program, but I was usually the one that people would turn to for help. I was good at what I was studying and I was proud. There was a building on campus that was open 24 hours for students. It had couches, armchairs, and coffee tables on one half and tables and regular chairs on the other, separated by a big fireplace. There were also two little secluded loft areas for small groups that wanted a little more privacy. People would go there to study or just hang out with friends. There was a cafe attached to it, so it made it ideal for a study spot. Coffee plus students in equals productiveness because I'm a coffee fanatic, some might say coffee snob. I was always in the study building where I had access to coffee when I wasn't in class or catching those oh-so-rare hours of sleep. The only problem, well, if you can call it a problem, was that I was the go-to person for the program. I would only sit down for a few minutes before someone would come up and sit with me, be it to study or to chat, usually the latter. When the end of sophomore year was rolling around, the dreaded exam time was approaching quickly. I was studying abroad my junior year and wanted to leave my school on a positive note. I was desperately trying to get some studying done, but people kept sitting to chat with me in the study building. Don't get me wrong, I'm not complaining. Oh my gosh, I look so popular that I can't even stand it. No, I loved my friends, but they couldn't really grasp the concept of silent studying. A few of them were already done with exams and just wanted to talk. I decided to try my luck in the library instead of heading to the study building. I went to a library and sat down at one of the little tables by a big window. I was on a roll. I had gone through quite a few big projects and finished writing one of my presentations. I sat up a little straighter and stretched out my arms in front of me, letting out a satisfied sigh. A voice from behind me suddenly said, Working hard? The library wasn't a popular space to study. Everyone usually went to the study building or got private rooms on the other side of the building. So the sudden voice behind me made me jump a bit. Um, yeah, I replied. He was a Chinese guy on the heavy side, a few inches taller than me. Sorry, do I know you? Now, I, I don't remember his name, so for this story, I will just call him Chen. Yeah, we met at orientation. We are friends on Facebook, he said. His English was good. 
but sometimes his accent was hard to understand. He still didn't give me his name, but he looked at me so expectantly that I felt bad for not remembering him. Oh yeah, I blurted out, it's nice to see ya. How, how are finals going? We talked a little about school and some other small talk. It was getting late though, so I excused myself to go back to my share house for the evening. The next day, I avoided the study building again, hoping to get the same amount of studying done that I had the day before. I, I walked quietly into the hall, glancing around. I didn't see Chen, so I went to my table from the day before and sat down. It wasn't 15 minutes before he appeared though, sitting down next to me and trying to strike up a conversation. I was a little annoyed, but I stayed polite. I excused myself after about an hour of awkward conversations with a stranger and gave up for the evening. It was still early, but I grabbed some friends and we went out for dinner at a local diner. The next day, I decided to try again. I went into the library and much to my dismay, I saw him sitting at my favorite table. At first, I was annoyed, but then I thought, wait a second, he is here first, so I can just grab a different table and he won't notice. I walked to the other side of the room, passing rows and rows of bookshelves, sitting down at a corner table. If he found me, it would have to be because he was actively looking. About an hour later, I heard footsteps heading around the quiet room. Then I quickened pace headed straight for me. Hey! I groaned internally, but put a polite smile on. Hey there. He had brought his stuff and sat down across from me. After a painful half hour, I finally gave up and decided to head home. The next day, I decided to talk to the front desk about getting a private room. They were on a different floor, so surely I'd be safe there. Nope. He found me. After knocking repeatedly on the door and staring at me, I could no longer pretend that I didn't see or hear him, even with my headphones on. If I waited much longer, I'm sure the other people in the area would be just as annoyed as me, and I didn't want to ruin their study time. I opened the door. Oh, hey. I was actually getting ready to leave. I lied. So soon? I was hoping you can check my English paper. Ah, jeez. Way to make me feel guilty. Well, I could spare a few. Cool! He pushed his way in, sitting down at the table. Sighing, I sat back down and took his paper. As I started checking it, he started talking about how he had never shared a meal with a girl before because he thinks it's such an intimate thing. I was checking his paper as quick as I could, trying to get away from the awkward encounter, so I let out the occasional uh-huh and head nod barely listening. Suddenly, he started pulling food out of his bag from a nearby Chinese restaurant and hands me a fork. I'm sitting there thinking, wait, what? He just said he thinks food sharing with a girl is intimate. Luckily, I was able to form words. Your paper looks good. I don't see any real English mistakes. I can't stay, though. I have plans to eat dinner with some friends. Sorry. I passed him his paper, stood up and left. Slightly creeped out. I would have blamed it on cultural differences but I knew a ton of other Chinese kids on campus and none of them were as weird as Chen. In fact, I was close to a lot of other Chinese kids because they were so cool. Chen was giving off some really scary vibes and I did not want to see him again. The next day, I decided it would be better just study at the study building. I'd rather be surrounded by chatterbox friends than alone with a creepy stranger. The loft was open when I arrived. You have to climb stairs to get to it and you can't really tell if anyone is up there let alone who, unless you are really trying to look up through the cracks or go halfway up the stairs. Practically giddy with joy, I rush up the stairs and settle into the armchair with a cup of coffee from the cafe. The giddiness of finding the loft open quickly wore off though, as I went into productive mode. I got a lot of studying done, but after about two hours, movement downstairs caught my eye. Chen was walking around, looking around the open floor. I took a deep, quiet breath and tried to push the paranoia down. No big deal, right? Maybe he was just tired of the library and wanted to study in this building for a change for the first time in two years. Then I heard it, those awful words. He was asking a group of people I knew if they'd seen me, asking about me by name. Luckily, they arrived after me and didn't see me go up into the loft. I was safe. He looked around a little more and finally left. The next day, I promised a Japanese friend of mine that I helped him with his paper. My Japanese friend was six foot tall, ripped like a quarterback, phenomenon of a man named Tetsu. We agreed to meet in the loft at a set time, and I arrived a bit early to make sure that we'd actually get to the loft, since it was a bit popular. 
I was sitting in the armchair when I heard him start coming up the stairs. He was 15 minutes early, how very Japanese, I thought jokingly. My heart dropped when I looked up, though. Not Tetsuo. Chen. He silently stalked over to the sofa, dropped his things, and sat on the coffee table in front of me. He put a hand on each of the arms of the chair, locking me in, and proceeded to forcefully kiss me. He was bigger than me in both height and weight, and it took a lot of me to push him off of me. I'm sure that the rush of adrenaline helped. What are you doing? I shrieked. I'm in love with you. I want to be with you. I want you to marry me and move back to China with me and start a family with me. He started to lean in again. I leaned back, tried to push him away. Get away from me! He leaned back a little, but kept his hands on the arms of the chairs and his knees on the either side of mine, locking me in so I couldn't get away. What's wrong? What's wrong? Did he really just ask me what was wrong? Was he stupid as well as crazy? You're, no, just no, get away from me. I tried to wiggle free, but he was stronger than me. I don't even know you, but I know you, he said. I need you. I love you. I was about to scream for help when Tetsuo came pounding up the stairs in a rush. Chen may have been bigger than me, but Tetsuo was way bigger than Chen. He looked right at me, asking in Japanese, are you okay? I replied in Japanese, saying, help me. He started walking towards us, and Chen immediately leaned back and let me go. Tetsuo took my hand, pulling me to sit on the sofa right next to him, saying in English, You promised to help me with my English paper. I was shaking, but I felt significantly safer with Tetsuo there to help me. He could easily take down Chen, if it came to that. Chen didn't leave. He sat in the armchair I had just vacated and waited. Did he think that Tetsuo would just leave, and he would continue to harass me? We continued Tetsuo's paper in about an hour. I took my time explaining certain grammar points and spelling patterns, hoping that we could take long enough, and Chen would give up and go away. He didn't. Tetsuo got up and stood between my stalker and me. Let's get some dinner. He picked up my stuff, took my hand, and pulled me down the stairs without a second glance at Chen. We didn't get dinner for obvious reasons. I didn't have an appetite. Tetsuo did walk me home, though, and I told him all about Chen. He said that until finals were over, and until I left the university to go home for the summer, he would act as my bodyguard. He said he would take me to all my classes, and stay with me outside of class. He was true to his word, but Chen was always within view. The day of my last exam, I met Tetsuo in the study building. We looked around and didn't see Chen. With that, I said that I was going to buy a coffee from the cafe. Upon entering the cafe, I rushed to the counter and ordered my usual, a medium black coffee. My blood turned ice as a voice behind me said, make it a large, on me. Chen, he was hidden in the cafe, knowing that I would be there for my coffee like always. No, I told the woman behind the counter, my usual medium please, I'll be paying for it myself too. Let me, he insisted. There was a little bit of back and forth between us, thinking that we were a couple or something. A woman behind the counter smiled and said, Oh, just let the guy get you a cup of coffee. I begrudgingly agreed and rushed away as soon as it was in my hand. He was still paying. He got up to me before I could reach Tetsuo, though. So close. There was a pillar in the way, though, so Tetsuo couldn't see me. Every time I tried to move, Chen stepped in my path and stopped me. He began begging me, marriage, family, China, no, no, no. Tetsuo realized... I was taking too long and came to rescue me, telling Chen to stay away from me. As you're walking away, Chen said, I won't give up. Not ever. Not even if you marry someone else. I took my last exam and moved back to Illinois that evening. I did find Chen on Facebook and blocked him. It wasn't hard to locate him after he started liking all of my photos. I studied abroad in Japan for a year and had to go back to Illinois University for my senior year. I had a boyfriend now, who is now my husband. A friend and I rented a house just off campus, but the internet wasn't going to be set up for another few days, so I wanted to use the free Wi-Fi at the study building. While I was talking to my boyfriend, who was still in Japan, Chen appeared in front of me. He immediately began trying to talk to me, then noticed I was talking on the phone and decided to stand there silently, staring and waiting. My blood ran cold, and I began to panic, telling my boyfriend in Japanese what was happening. I told him about Chen while we were in Japan. He told me to run away or to find somebody nearby to help me. Instead, the anger in me began to rise. I wasn't some pitiful little girl that needed help whenever something happened. When I was in Japan, I had experiences that demanded I stand up for myself and this time wasn't any different. I looked at him and said, I'm talking to my boyfriend, please leave me alone. He stood there staring at me for what felt like hours, though I'm sure it was only a few minutes. After narrowing his eyes and glaring at my phone, he walked away. I managed to avoid him for most of the year. 
but I almost always saw him lurking nearby, staring at me. Because I was almost always surrounded by friends, though. He never dared to come near and beg me for marriage again. He tried to approach me more than once when I was alone, but I made it clear to him that I, I would scream if he touched me. I, ca I kept it public places and made sure to never ever be in an empty place. I think it helped that Tetsu was usually by my side, too. I live in Japan now with my husband. It's been three years since I graduated, and I haven't seen or heard from Chen since. Matthew the Alien Prophet. I was 27 years old at the time, postgraduate school, and committed to my third visit at the Behavioral Health Unit, which is nice speak for Nut House. Now, my visits were always an aggravating little problem with suicide, at which I obviously failed miserably, but this was a catch all state institution. The attempted suicides were thrown in with drug addicts, alcoholics, anger management types, and true psychotics who deserved actual hospitalization, not the trap, medicate, release treatment method. Due to the nature of such places, one is always destined to meet some delightfully weird persons. This being my third visit, the staff knew me and called me Miss Professor due to my former employment as an adjunct faculty at one of the state's universities. On my second day there, a 30-something year old man named Matthew was admitted into the institution. Matthew was a religious fanatic, was tall, scruffy, thin, with a patchy haircut, and a bad case of the sweats. He had a steadfast determination to go sockless, and he tended to eschew showering. Now that I can blame him too much there, the group showers looked like something out of a hostel. Matthew constantly wandered, mumbling up and down the halls. This stuff alone didn't make Matthew creepy. I was in an institution after all. We were all some variety of disturbed. What made Matthew creepy was he decided to form a tight attachment to me while divulging the secrets of his intricate paranoia to me, always in whispers, always after appearing silently behind me, like some kind of deranged ninja. So, Matthew followed me everywhere around the faculty, consisting of, besides lockable bedrooms, a common room, hallway, nurse's station, and cafeteria. He appeared behind me at my shoulder and started whisper mumbling about what a good girl I was. A sampling of his ramblings usually included the following. Good girls are like the Virgin Mary, bad girls are whores. All whores will burn in hellfire. The star children worked with Jesus and taught him special, secret martial arts. I felt bad for him, and the faculty staff initially found his attachment to be quite funny. Oh, looks like you got a boyfriend, Professor. Or Matthew, you gonna ask the professor out to dinner where I'll break out of here? Until so Matthew began to furrow his face into an expression of pure hatred upon hearing such jokes. The staff's good-natured rubbing dwindled to the occasional aside to me during morning vital checks when Matthew was out of earshot in the men's line. Furthermore, Matthew, Matthew was medicated out the ass. We all knew what everyone else was prescribed since the waiting line to the meds was pretty chatty. But all the hardcore antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, and tranquilizers had zero effect on his behavior. He might as well have been taking a tiny paper cup brimming with multicolored sugar pills instead of a rainbow of potent pharmaceuticals. Matthew started to get more frightening when Alicia was admitted. Alicia was for meth addiction rehab, and she was extroverted, funny, and a bit brash. Matthew thought she was a cohort of Satan in the common room. He would glare at Alicia while pacing back and forth, radiating hostility and mumbling non-existent passages from the Bible he constantly held. He would stop periodically to creep up behind me while I was trying to read a book and whisper something like, Alicia will die in agony. She's a whore. Whores burn in hellfire. I can make the hellfire come down. Variations on this theme occurred throughout the day and into the night until we were ushered into our bedrooms and the doors locked. In the mornings, when the dorm rooms were unlocked, Matthew would be there outside mine, waiting and pacing. A couple days after her admittance, I took Alicia aside to let her know that she might want to watch out for Matthew. I didn't know for sure if his delusions ever crossed into real action. Alicia found the whole situation hilarious. She had, of course, noticed his pacing and glaring and mumbling, and then began to fuck with him. 
holding glare offs, speaking loudly about her role in Lucifer's army, tugging her t-shirt down so that her cleavage was visible, etc. Matthew followed me and confided in me with intense frequency. About one week into my stay, all the patients were sitting in the common room to catch the local nightly news. The news anchor announced that a search was on for Matthew John Doe, a schizophrenic with violent tendencies, who had disappeared from his elderly mother's house several days prior. Naturally, we all erupted into a chorus of holy fucking shits as Matthew John Doe was sitting there placidly, silent, and cross-legged on the floor staring blankly at the TV screen and clutching his Bible. So the nurses were informed and the police called, and Matthew's identity and whereabouts were confirmed. He'd been hauled and dumped into the facility by the police, apparently without any background check, under the assumption that he was an unwell vagrant. As a final kiss-off, the police left him in the care of the institution, after informing the nurses and doctors that it's where he would have ended up regardless. Everyone approached Matthew more gingerly at this point, except for Alicia, who found it a laugh riot to get him even more riled up by making up stories of her sordid sexual exploits. Matthew followed me even more closely, despite the nurses and aides' admonishments to stop. During art therapy sessions, he would sit so closely to me that he breathed down my neck, and then he decoded signs and signals from my drawings. Most of the messages he found in the shitty throwaway art involved the apocalypse, the mutilation and massacre of all whores, and the miracle seed that would spring from my belly. He had developed this virgin whore dichotomy obsession with me and Alicia. The concept of me as the good woman was weird in itself, as I had blue hair and extensive tattooing, while Alicia looked like a cute girl next door, despite the rough, meth addict edges. Finally, I was deemed no longer a danger to myself, and the staff called a friend of mine to come collect me. I said my goodbyes to everyone and Matthew was visibly, visibly upset, even raising his voice above his customary mumble, though what he said was mostly incomprehensible. I was nervous about how he'd react when left with Alicia, but Alicia assured me that she could take care of herself. As I stood near the locked doors to wait for my ride, Matthew materialized behind me and whispered, They think I don't know what I'm doing, but I know exactly what I'm doing. I turned to face him, and he was smiling. He was smiling in an eerily sane, cognizant manner, and it was far, far creepier than all his previous insanity combined. I didn't reply. I'll see you again, the star children of Jesus told me. It is meant to be. Your womb will be touched and blessed. Your death will make the abominations die, he said. My ride arrived shortly afterward. Skipping class led me to a very awkward situation. Hey everyone, hope you're having a nice day. This encounter took place a year and a half ago, but I kind of want to share. So it was a nice October evening. I was still in my senior year of high school, 16 female. I was attending some evening English classes at the time. I'm from a non-English speaking country, but it's sad to skip since I was kind of worn out from all the studying. Instead, I went to my favorite half library, half shop establishment at a mall. I actually went there on purpose to buy a Hunter Thompson's book since I was and still am a huge fan of his works. However, once I came there, I noticed they had a concert evening, and some small hippie band was singing just near the shelves I needed to go to. The library is a two-stories establishment, with the second floor being really small and like a balcony. Basically, it was a big square first floor, and the second floor was as if the square was cut from the inside. I'm sorry, I can't explain it well. But the point is, you could see the whole library from any spot, there weren't any separate rooms. So I just get to the second floor and browse the biography and memoir shelves, thinking of how I could get my desired book. No one was even sitting near the band, so I anticipated that it wasn't it wasn't allowed getting near them. There was a couple more people near me, but I didn't pay attention. Suddenly a man came up behind me and said, Excuse me, can I look at these books? Being that I wasn't really interested in any of those, and looked through them just to kill some time, 
I immediately replied something like, yes, of course, and shifted slightly to my right. When the man was directly near me, I could get a good look at him. The first thing I thought upon checking him out is that he looked very much like Mads Milkinson, maybe a slightly uglier version of him. He was well-dressed, looked normal and presentable. I didn't think anything of him, but then he started talking to me. Asked something like, hey, what are you up to? Why are you here? I was a little shocked since this man was obviously a lot older than me. And I've always looked around my age, maybe even a little younger than my age. But I went along, replying something like, yeah, I'm here to get this book. And there's a band there and I don't know if I can get to it. He asked for my name. I was smart enough to give him a fake one. Then he starts very eagerly talking about the author, Gonzo Journalism. And from his body language, I immediately understand what he was up to. My mother is a psychologist, so she taught me a lot of things about people and whatnot. So I picked up on his intentions very fast. This man was after me. We made small talk. I was obviously uncomfortable, but didn't know how to get out of this situation. He was talking non-stop, trying to hang on to me, and then at one point my phone buzzed. I thought someone was calling me and turned around. He asked me if he was bothering me, being a little polite self. I said no with a little fake laugh. I should have just brushed him off, really. So then came a really disturbing point when he asked for my age. I cheerfully replied that I was 16, which by the way was true thinking that would scare him away, but no, he didn't care that I was a minor, he just happily replied that he was 46, it got more creepy for me, and when he offered a chat over coffee, I said something on the lines of, but I'm 16, I can't really hang around older men, to this he replied something I remember very well, with a serious expression. You're already 16, that's old enough, you're also just so sexy, that's why I approached you. At this point, I was hysterical on the inside. I mean, I knew that this guy couldn't try anything in a fairly crowded shop, but it was still scary as all hell. So I obediently went to a little dining lobby in the corner of the library, trying to brainstorm any strategies of retreat. Maybe it was a dumb idea, but as I decided to say, Oh, I actually have a dance class soon. I'll be late if I don't go now. So I get the book and we'll be going. He took it well and waited for me. I went straight for the book. I didn't even care about the band anymore. While I was at the counter paying for it, I really hoped I could slip away. But this man waited just behind me and called for me right when I was about to book it out of the door. He started asking me about my dance classes, what, what style I was learning, where my dance studio was, etc. I tried to give the most vague answers I could, so he just dropped it and came straight to the point, scheduling, scheduling a date. He kept rambling about this new bubble tea place, visibly desperate to try to drag me into this. I just replied that it wasn't a good idea, and then he asked, When then? I just threw a never at him, and sped walked away. He mumbled in, Oh, okay then, and then went the opposite way. Needless to say, it's not that creepy and really anticlimactic, but I was pretty shaking that evening. I, uh, I don't even know why. I've been catcalled a lot and hit on by older men quite a bit too, but this particular encounter was really, really unnerving. Even though I don't think anything of it now, every time I look at the book I remember this man. I hope we never meet again. And yeah, one last thing. I learned a valuable lesson from this. Fuck politeness. She put me in an awkward position. I've been lurking for a while, but this is my first post. Reading all these posts has pulled out some memories that I should probably get off my chest. I hope this actually belongs here, and if it doesn't, t tell me, just don't downvote. When I was around 17 years old, I had a friend who was sort of a bad influence. She was a really nice girl, but she got me into some situations that I didn't appreciate. Once she introduces me to her best friend, a guy who was much older than we were at the time. I believe he was anywhere from 25 to 35. He would provide her with alcohol, weed, a hot tub, and a place to stay when her parents kicked her out. She called him Fifi, and it took me years to understand why. We would go over there once or twice a week, usually while he was napping or gone, to soak in the hot tub after school or before work. One day he joined us and gave us a case of Smirnoff ice. 
being sheltered and 17. I hadn't gotten drunk more than once or twice, so it didn't take much for me to get pretty rowdy. He'd always make out with me, then to feel each other up, then to take our tops off again. After being so sheltered, it was fun to do something so naughty, but in the back of my mind, it bothered me because he was so much older. Later, I found out she was having sex with him, and I told her I didn't want to go over there anymore. I told her he made me feel uncomfortable, and I didn't want him to expect me to do the same thing. She told me he wouldn't, and to not worry. About a month after, she called and asked if I would go to his house and get her work shirt for her while she was doing God knows what. Being the pushover I am, I went. When I got there, he was sleeping, but I invited myself inside and found her clothes. He woke up and asked how I was and if I wanted to smoke a little before I left. I accepted, and we sat in his room getting high and talking about her for a while. After a while, he started edging closer and touching my leg, working his way up to my thigh. I felt a panic, but I was high, and I usually feel panicked, so I played it off and stood up to leave. He grabbed me and said, baby, don't go, it's okay. We can have some fun. I said I wasn't in the mood for fun, and ran out as fast as I could. I told her about it and she just laughed it off. He then began texting me and asking for pictures, becoming increasingly aggressive about it. She kept trying to get me over there and eventually, I went, thinking I was being silly about the whole situation. We sat in the hot tub and did the usual drinking and smoking and playing around. She went to bed and left me alone with him. He once again began touching me, but this time I was too drunk to drive, so I let him. Soon he began going up my shirt and talking about my juicy little pussy. And that was the last straw. I left, drunk, and drove to the gas station and called another friend to pick me up. I never went to his house again. This bitch got me in many situations like this, but I'm grateful for them. It's helped me become less sheltered and realize there are people out there who aren't as friendly as you think they are. Not that everyone is out to get you, but it's good not to be a pushover and say no when you are uncomfortable. Just needed some water. Early last year, I had a strange encounter that you all might find interesting. So, quick tidbit about myself. I help people as often as I can, including giving money to homeless people or giving rides to hitchhikers if we're going the same direction. 98% of the time, the worst I've encountered is awkward conversations and being asked if I have meth to sell. This is not one of those times. I live in a lower income area of my city, and only about a half a mile from the local homeless shelter, so I've seen plenty of people in a sad state during the two years I lived there. My apartment building kind of sat in a little valley, with a little ravine across the street that deer hung out in. I lived on the third floor. So one day I come home, it's blowing snow and around 15 degrees. In my entryway is a dude sitting on the staircase. It was obvious he was homeless and looking for a place to warm up, as he was wearing four days worth of clothes at once and had two backpacks with him. Not a big deal, as long as he's not sitting there when the building is locked up for the day. Our shitty security consisted of having locks set for a 9 to 5 office hours. As I pass him on the staircase, I give him a smile as I do to literally every other stranger, not screaming at me on the planet. He stops me and tries to talk to me. Now, it's obvious he doesn't speak very good English, but I was able to discern that he was asking for water and that he was waiting for a friend who lived in the building to come home. Yep, no problem. I head up to my apartment to get water for him, and he follows me. This was a bit uncomfortable, but I was already having a hard time communicating with him, so I let it slide. This is where things go wonky. My apartment was in efficiency, where the bathroom was right inside the front door, and then a tiny hallway into, well, everything else. I walk to the kitchen to get the water, and he points out the bathroom, yeah, sure, dude. I have cleaning supplies, that's what they're for. So I go around the corner, pull a couple bottles of water from the fridge, come back, and he's standing there butt naked in the hallway. Then it dawns on me, water. He was asking for a shower, oh gods. Then he tries to ask me to join him, oh no, hard fucking no, you understand, no, right? He goes into the shower, and I pace in my living room trying to figure out 
how the frack I can communicate with him that he needs to leave. Cause he went from uncomfortable to cryptastic in 0.06 seconds, then it got worse. He comes out, again buck naked, without a towel and begins wandering around my apartment, commenting on everything. Oh, and... And... He's hard. Did I mention that part? Yeah. I lose my shit, politely, because once you're in retail, that never goes away. Trying to get him to put clothes on, he doesn't understand me. I pull up my phone, pull up Google Translate, and show him the list of languages. He understood what I was asking, and selected Somalian. Goody. Progress. Now, the things he's commenting on in terrible half-English is things like, You live alone? Does his TV work? Nope, 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 nope. Done. I typed into Google Translate, asking he needed to call his friend or call the apartment management. He gives me a thumbs up, then climbs into my loft bed. Guess I'm cleaning that now, too, so I'm like, which one? Another thumbs up, okay, so he either didn't get what I was trying to do with the app, after all, or he can't fucking read. Eventually, my lizard brain took a breather from panicking long enough for the logic part of my brain to take over, and I went to where his clothes were and pointed at them, and then at the door. He got dressed and left. Simple. Done. Over. I shake for about two hours, drink a six-pack, and post what happened to Facebook. And that time it dawns on me that I probably just got stalked for theft. So I spent another hour double and triple checking my security camera for later. The next day, he was on the stairs again. I tried to be pleasant, but made it very clear with head shakes and a roundabout trip back down the stairs and back up the other flight on the other side of the building to my apartment that I wasn't going to help him again or be his buddy. Two days after that, he was there again. I told the landlady and she had him removed and I never saw him again. And before you ask, no, nothing was stolen. I moved to the exact opposite end of the city four months ago. So, random naked homeless dude. Let's not meet again.